Well, um, good afternoon everyone. It's uh, really an enormous pleasure to uh, be back in Singapore. Um, you will be well aware of the uh, closed border policy that my country adopted um, for uh, uh, a number of years, which raised all sorts of interesting international law issues. Um, so it's been a, a tremendous pleasure over the last few months to start to travel again and to engage with a number of you and to, to meet new friends, but uh, especially to be back uh, here in Singapore. And uh, Bob and I have a very long uh, acquaintance, which goes back to days when we were sort of dueling Jessup Moot coaches. I think we first met in Washington. So it's been an absolute delight to have our careers parallel in different ways uh, around the world over a number of years. So, colleagues, um, this afternoon's presentation um, with uh, Nulfa to give uh, some remarks is really, I guess, uh, part two of a conversation that uh, we had uh, at a conference in Seoul uh, in November. And so that the timing of that is quite significant, as you will uh, appreciate and as you will learn. Um, so obviously since November there's been a, a number of developments on this particular topic uh, which I'm going to uh, expand upon uh, this afternoon. Now it's really important that I make it exceptionally clear to you uh, that I'm not advising anyone at all on this particular matter. So I'm really giving you a perspective here from that of, a, of an academic and, and Bob's sketched for you uh, my background in that regard. Uh, can I, uh, though, advise you that there is a third edition of Rothwell and Stevens on the way, uh, and we briefly touch on issues of advisory uh, opinions. So um, you've got here a bit of a structure in terms of uh, what I want to do, and I wanted to, I guess, sort of sketch out um, advisory opinions, uh, particularly as they relate to uh, law of the sea matters, and then having provided uh, that sort of framework uh, to then me really move into uh, look at some of the uh, contemporary uh, questions. So here's a bit of a snapshot in terms of the, the status of uh, advisory opinions before the, the ICJ and uh, the PCIJ. And of course there's a, a multitude of issues that arise there in terms of um, jurisdiction admissibility uh, and um, it's interesting to observe that um, both the PCIJ and the International Court of Justice um, have to date, and to date is important, uh, declined only uh, to exercise their advisory jurisdiction on, on one occasion. And so I think we can immediately draw from that that um, the international courts at the, at the peak level in our system, both prior to and since uh, World War II, have been very open to receiving and handing down uh, advisory opinions. Uh, now, of course, there's an asterisk there because uh, we know that the International Court of Justice um, has received a new request for an advisory opinion, uh, not on law of the sea matters, um, but that is in the very early stages of its processes and no doubt that will play out uh, in, in due course. Um, all of us who've, who've looked and considered international law in multiple capacities will be aware of the significance of advisory opinions uh, from time to time. But I guess when I started to look at this um, topic in a bit more detail, I was, I was struck by the fact that advisory opinions as they relate to uh, the law of the sea um, are difficult to really uh, clearly identify. And it's difficult to identify any advisory opinions that have had any real significance from a law of the sea perspective. 
Um, that doesn't mean to say that obviously the advisory opinions looking at general principles of law may not have had repercussions for the law of the sea, but they haven't necessarily had the same precise implications as they may have had in other areas. And that's interesting because there's one advisory opinion that I'll look at in a little bit of detail, but which, which you might have thought would be relevant, but ultimately it wasn't. So just looking at um, the ICJ and its track record of advisory opinions, um, critical questions arise in terms of jurisdiction and admissibility of the request presented to the court, um, the way in which the court might exercise its, its discretion, or which is also called in the literature the judicial function of the court. Um, another really interesting dynamic has been the growth of submissions by state parties uh, before the court in advisory opinions and also increasingly uh, international organisations. And you, you might argue that uh, ICJ advisory opinions over the last 20 years in particular have raised uh, some precise issues about the, the legal and political uh, questions. And that was certainly an issue that uh, arose in the context of the Palestinian wall advisory opinion that will no doubt arise in the context of the current uh, advisory opinion request uh, before the National Court of Justice. And of course, you'll be aware of the um, heightened political rhetoric that we're seeing from some parties in terms of that ICJ advisory opinion request. And, and of course, the Chagos uh, Archipelago case also raises an interesting issue as to whether or not uh, an advisory opinion um, has been, uh, the advisory opinion mechanism has been utilised as a way of actually resolving a legal dispute between states, uh, as opposed to seeking uh, an advisory opinion by the court on, on legal issues that might be relevant. And I'll come back to that in a moment. So um, th that's a bit of a snapshot in terms of advisory opinions with respect to the ICJ and the PCIJ uh, in particular. So let's move on to uh, the law of the sea, uh, which is our particular area of interest uh, this afternoon. So uh, when, we, when we move to think about uh, advisory opinions under the framework of the law of the sea convention, we, we now have three advisory opinions, uh, of which one is under um, consideration and at an exceptionally early stage of the process. So we have three applications. Uh, none have been declined, but there's an asterisk there because we have one which uh, remains to be determined in terms of issues of jurisdiction and admissibility and the way in which the uh, tribunal will ultimately uh, deal with the matter. So one of the particular issues that those of us who focus on law of the sea have of course been interested in is that when we think about advisory opinions and the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, of course, um, there is one obvious uh, mechanism and procedure and article in the convention which anticipates uh, precisely uh, requests for advisory opinions and that's found in Article 191 of the convention uh, which makes it quite clear that the seabed disputes uh, chamber of the tribunal uh, shall give advisory opinions at the request of the Assembly or the Council on legal questions. So um, to that end, uh, it was clearly contemplated at the time that the convention was concluded that there would be an advisory function resting uh, with the seabed disputes chamber of the tribunal, but potentially within a, a relatively narrow uh, frame. And so to that end, if we, if we sort of unpack Article 191, um, well then these are the various elements that we uh, might be able to identify uh, with respect uh, to that. And um, whilst this is not necessarily the major focus of my presentation this afternoon, uh, of course we've got an example of this mechanism uh, being uh, utilised. Um, and I guess one aspect to think about is, is the way in which uh, it's made clear that the advisory opinions are to be given as a matter of urgency, which is reflected, as you can see, in the language of Article 191. Uh, and we can think about the way in which 
um, the International Court perhaps is, has sought to expedite advisory opinion uh, proceedings. We certainly know that um, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea has, has quite properly expedited proceedings with respect to uh, provisional measures and, and um, prompt release type matters. Um, but um, we have to date not necessarily a great deal of practice with respect to the, the issues of matters of urgency. However, um, those of us who attended um, this conference in Seoul in November, I think would have been struck by the fact that a number of the uh, judges of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea who were present and actively spoke about the role and capacity of ITLOS to give advisory opinions art under the Article 191 procedure, um, I think certainly suggested that, that the tribunal was aware of the importance of the potential requests that might arise to it uh, in relation to the utilisation of this procedure. And given the, the, the commercial and other issues that could arise with respect to some of those advisory opinion requests, this issue as to how quickly the tribunal might act uh, might be an interesting dimension uh, associated uh, with that. So uh, the, the next um, area of um, interest is what exactly does the, the statute of ITLOS uh, have to say about um, advisory opinions? Uh, well, it, it references quite properly the role of the, the Seabed Disputes uh, Chamber um, and the, the processes and mechanisms uh, associated uh, with that. Um, and that's to be expected given um, the way in which Article 191 is framed uh, as, I've, as I've advised. Um, and of course this provision here is directly related to the role of the Seabed Disputes uh, Chamber. Uh, however, um, the other aspect um, that's uh, increasingly uh, of interest uh, to us is the way in which under the rules of the tribunal um, advisory proceedings are anticipated and increasingly we're starting to focus in on uh, the final dot point on that slide and that is the relevance of Article uh, 138. So the general um, proposition that uh, applies with respect to the, the competence of international courts and tribunals uh, and the way in which they are to determine questions of jurisdiction and admissibility is the uh, competence, competence rule that um, my uh, mentor, James Crawford, uh, and indeed many other scholars and jurists have written about, but you can see uh, Judge Crawford's uh, reference there. Um, so there's nothing exceptional about the fact that uh, international courts and tribunals determine uh, their own competence, uh, but of course they will often do so on the basis of the submissions that have been received uh, before them. And to that end, um, if we reflect upon the earlier figures that I've shown you, um, where the National Court of Justice, for example, has had its, its competence to give advisory opinions challenged, uh, by states on a number of occasions, the, the court has rarely determined that it doesn't have uh, jurisdiction and competence and uh, the ability to proceed to determine uh, an advisory opinion request. So um, the rules of the tribunal then become uh, relevant. Uh, Article 16, um, the tribunal has the ability quite properly to frame its rules for carrying out its functions. And the way that it's done that is reflected in Articles 130 to 138. Uh, and it's interesting to observe um, that predominantly um, those relevant rules are ones that relate to the Seabed Disputes Chamber's uh, advisory function. So we have this one single article, uh, Article 138, which uh, envisages uh, potentially a much broader uh, ITLOS uh, advisory uh, function. And so we therefore need to turn to what Article 138 uh, says. So there's, there's an awful lot to unpack in terms of this single article of the ITLOS uh, rules. Um, the tribunal may give 
an advisory opinion. So that in itself opens up a lot of capacity for the tribunal to determine whether or not it should give an advisory opinion. Um, the advisory opinions have to be a legal question. Perhaps not that extraordinary, given that the tribunal is a, uh, a law of the sea tribunal. Its whole function is based around considering legal issues. Um, but the, the ability of the tribunal to give that advisory opinion is conditional. If you look through the various provisions, uh, conditional on there being an international agreement. It's an interesting choice of term for those of us who teach treaty law. Um, it doesn't use the word an international treaty, it just says international agreement. Uh, arguably many states would take the view, I think, uh, as a result of state practice over the last 40 years, that the term international agreement um, is certainly one that's broad enough um, to encompass um, VCLT Article 2 definitions of a treaty, um, but there could be some possible interesting uh, issues around that. But it, the term international agreement doesn't distinguish between uh, bilateral, trilateral, uh, multilateral or plurilateral. It just needs to be an international agreement. By definition, you can have an international agreement between two states, of course. Um, the international agreement, though, um, must be one that conforms to some levels of specificity. Um, it must be one which is related to the purposes of the convention, i.e. the Law of the Sea Convention, and uh, that international agreement must specifically, that's a very precise term, isn't it? Specifically, it doesn't say generally or just provide, it has to specifically provide for the submission to the tribunal of a request for such an opinion. So the Article 138 uh, provision, which anticipates the capacity for the tribunal to receive requests for advisory opinions, um, is conditional on a number of requirements uh, being, being met. Um, and that raises some interesting issues um, about um, agreements which uh, predate uh, 1982, it would seem to me. Um, so that agreements post-1982, which contemplated the existence of the Law of the Sea Convention, would be ones that could fall within uh, this particular uh, remit. But as we'll see, in terms of what we're coming to, um, that certainly opens the door for uh, a very precise and very particular type of instrument which is specifically framed around those elements in Article 138 to meet uh, the many requirements uh, that exist there. So I'll come back to some aspects of this but clearly Article 138 raises uh, a number of issues, has a number of implications uh, and uh, they will be ones that are actively under consideration um, by both scholars and states uh, in coming months. So what is the, the track record in terms of advisory opinions uh, before um, the tribunal generally? Uh, well, so we've had two advisory opinions uh, and the, the first is the uh, 2011 uh, Seabed Disputes Chamber advisory opinion um, requested by the, the International uh, Seabed Authority. Now, at one level, in terms of the, the general issues that I've been discussing, um, it, it could be said that this advisory opinion was relatively straightforward. It was clearly made in contemplation of the unambiguous Article 191 uh, capacity of the Seabed's Disputes uh, Tribunal. Notice that um, the request um, particularly references Article 131 of the rules. So to that end, um, this advisory opinion, um, whilst it was, it was novel, it was, it was groundbreaking because this was the first occasion in which this advisory mechanism had been utilised. Um, because of all of those reasons, it was of course an important one. Um, it, it was not necessarily exceptional and clearly it was one that could have been within the contemplation of um, the tribunal and the seabed disputes uh, chamber. I'm not going to spend much more time on this, um, but 
Um, it's interesting that when the uh, chamber of the tribunal came to look at this issue, it unanimously decided that it had jurisdiction and it would unanimously respond to the request for the advisory opinion. Uh, and the, the critical issues that were um, looked at in terms of all of those threshold issues that I've tried to highlight in terms of the ability of the um, Seabed Disputes Chamber to give the advisory opinion that were requested. They were, of course, um, looked at in some considerable detail by the Seabed Disputes Chamber, but ultimately uh, all of the boxes were ticked and the tribunal, uh, the chamber went about its business of, of delivering its advisory opinion. Now, um, the only thing that I'll say in addition about this advisory opinion is that it immediately identified the interests of parties and others in the international community other than states. And so states were able to participate in the advisory opinion, um, but here we have a number of colleagues from the IUCN um, who were able to uh, make submissions and actually appear uh, before the tribunal. So. Um, Certain international organisations and uh, non-governmental organisations with certain standing uh, were granted the capacity to appear uh, before the seabed uh, disputes, disputes chamber. So that immediately identifies that uh, even back in 2011, um, there was a, a particular dynamic emerging in terms of the interests of, uh, of entities other than states to appear uh, before, the, before the tribunal. Okay, so the next um, advisory opinion request um, is one that's much more relevant to uh, current events. Uh, and so this is the um, uh, commonly referred to as the F SRFC advisory opinion by the Sub-Regional Fisheries uh, Commission. So, um, those of us who, who don't follow with great um, uh, attention um, all of the multitude of fisheries instruments uh, may have been surprised to know that this body even existed. Um, but it, it did and it was a legitimate body for the purposes of making a request uh, for an advisory opinion consistent with all of the processes uh, that we've spoken about uh, earlier. Um, and the um, Convention on the Determination of the Minimal Conditions for Access and Exploitation of Marine Resources within the Marine Areas on the Jurisdiction of the Member States, the SRFC, uh, comprising um, seven, seven states that you can see there, uh, and they sent a request for an advisory opinion arising from um, a decision uh, made at the 14th session of the Commission uh, in, in 2013 and they sought to frame their request um, on issues of jurisdiction and admissibility around Article uh, 1381 of the uh, Convention. So this, uh, this was the first occasion where Article 1381 becomes, becomes relevant. So um, these are the questions uh, that were posed. Um, in that advisory opinion uh, request. So four questions and um, they are clearly questions that were considered to be particularly uh, relevant to the SRFC but we, we know of course that some of the issues that were raised in that advisory opinion request are ones that had more general interest uh, to the um, international community and to obviously member states of the Law of the Sea Convention because of the way in which it raised a number of issues with respect to IUU fishing within the EEZ, uh, the role of flag states and associated uh, issues. This immediately triggered um, a response from uh, state parties to the Convention who seriously questioned uh, whether or not this was a legitimate use of the uh, article uh, 138 uh, mechanisms that I'm talking about um, and um, I know Australia's position was very firmly was that this was not a matter which the tribunal uh, should seek to determine. Um, so in terms of the outcome of this particular uh, matter, um, 
tribunal um, listened to all of the uh, submissions made before it by states who favoured the exercise of jurisdiction and, and others who contested jurisdiction. Um, but it did find that it had jurisdiction, but it, it interestingly uh, narrowed and framed its jurisdiction with respect to issues uh, brought before it by the SRFC, uh, principally with respect to the uh, EEZ. And it responded to the various uh, questions that had been posed and um, immediately, um, without going into any of the detail, because that's not the purpose of this afternoon's presentation, all of those are matters that have uh, significance, relevance and are of interest um, not only to the states that are parties to the SRFC, uh, but obviously to state parties generally uh, with respect to the uh, convention. I'm just going to divert a little bit um, because um, I think that it, it is for completeness important to just touch upon uh, Chagos. Um, and the reason why I say that is, um, as Bob very kindly referenced, I've just completed a work on islands. In fact, Bob, the last time I was in this room, I was talking about uh, preliminary points about that, about that particular book. Now, Chagos um, is, of course, an ICJ advisory opinion. Um, it raises um, issues that are actually well beyond the scope of the Law of the Sea Convention. And, and if you do something very simple, uh, like a word search for Law of the Sea um, uh, of the advisory opinion, you, you come up with very few hits. So um, the, the, the International Court of Justice was not asked to address Law of the Sea issues in the in the Chagos advisory opinion, notwithstanding the fact that the, the, the potential significance of the advisory opinion in terms of all of the maritime issues arising in terms of the status of the Chagos archipelago are, of course, uh, very, very important. Um, the critical issues, of course, go to um, issues about decolonisation of the Chagos, um, issues of self-determination um, and UK state responsibility. And uh, the advisory opinion um, we know um, was, was very decisive and, and very clear on some of those issues in terms of the responsibility that the UK bore under international law with respect to uh, some of those issues. We know that the General Assembly, um, fairly promptly after the advisory opinion was handed down, adopted a, a General Assembly resolution um, reaffirming the importance of the advisory opinion, and that in itself is, is interesting to note um, in terms of the way in which the, the, the United Nations viewed an advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice. And we also know that in the last few months um, that there's been some um, movement on, on the issues in terms of uh, the status of the Chagos archipelago between uh, Mauritius uh, and the, the UK. And this is just a, a summary of the uh, key points arising uh, from that uh, advisory uh, opinion. Um, so as someone who's particularly interested in archipelagos, um, this was uh, potentially an advisory opinion that could have got me very excited, but it didn't address issues associated with archipelagos in a Law of the Sea Convention sense. But that's not in any way to diminish the significance of this advisory opinion. And um, I think we can we can foresee as a result of other uh, proceedings that are occurring um, in other fora that, that the Chagos issue is still quite unresolved and that there's a number of processes to go through uh, that at the moment. All right, let's move to um, what um, we in Australia would call the main game. So um, the main game arises from uh, the request uh, for an advisory opinion uh, submitted by the Commission of Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law, uh, formerly listed as case number 31, uh, submitted to the tribunal uh, following a request made on the 12th of December uh, 2022. So um, this is an advisory opinion request that uh, seeks to uh, utilise all of those Article 138 mechanisms uh, that I spoke about in the context of the SRFC uh, advisory opinion. So, um, first question is, well, what exactly is the status of the, um, of the Commission of Small Island States? So, uh, you can see there the, the formal uh, instrument 
the 2021 agreement for the Commission of Small Island States. But it's not just a commission on small island states, it's actually got an additional title uh, to it, Small Island States on Climate Change and International Law. Which has just raised an interesting question for me about how many treaties formally reference international law in their title. Um, there's a number of intriguing aspects about this agreement. Um, from a treaty law perspective, it was uh, signed in Edinburgh uh, on the 31st of October uh, 2021 um, at uh, COP26. And rather remarkably, for some treaty practices, it entered into force on the same day. Um, perhaps not completely exceptional, but a little unusual, you could argue. Um, and it was uh, registered uh, with the United Nations um, also at the same time. And you can see the UN registration number uh, there. Now, um, when the um, Commission um, was originally established in October 21, it only had two parties, uh, Antigua and Barbuda and Tuvalu. Uh, but since then, uh, four additional states have acceded uh, to the Commission. So as matters stand at the moment, there are four uh, states who are parties uh, to, the, to the Commission. And for those of you who are interested, um, the, the entitlement to become a member of the Commission of Small Island States um, is uh, limited to those states who are members of the Alliance of Small Island States. So there's a fairly select group who can become uh, members of uh, the Commission. And uh, you can do the math then in terms of which states might be eligible to become uh, members of the, of the Commission at some point uh, into the future. So um, the, the Commission submits this request for an advisory opinion to ITLOS consistent with the procedures that we've referred to and uh, this is um, the content of the, of the request. So let's just spend, uh, if I may, a, a few minutes just trying to unpack uh, some of the aspects of, of this request um, because clearly uh, we can immediately imagine uh, multiple uh, issues arising uh, from that. So some of, the, some of the issues that I see arising just from the words of the request um, in addition to issues of jurisdiction and admissibility that I've sort of highlighted uh, previously. Uh, is, is there a distinction between obligations under the Law of the Sea Convention? Note the opening words. What are the specific obligations of state parties? And is there a distinction between obligations of state parties in terms of responsibility under the Law of the Sea Convention? Note that the preambular words talk about obligations under the Convention, including under Part 12. Now, self-evidently, the issues that are raised are ones that are particularly relevant to Part 12, but are there other potential obligations that sit outside of Part 12, which this request is raising uh, for uh, consideration? So, are there particular obligations that exist under the EEZ provisions or the Continental Shelf provisions uh, or Part 11 provisions that might be uh, relevant or is that sort of redundant because in any event Part 12 is going to pick up all of those in any event. Note that the, the questions that have been posed are not ones that raise general issues with respect to uh, pollution. But it's p pollution of a certain type, um, a certain source, a certain impact that 
the tribunal is being asked to consider. Um, it's pollution arising from climate change and that caused by uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So it's not general pollution of the, of the marine environment. So we know at the moment that there's uh, an ongoing uh, process potentially resulting in the conclusion of a plastics treaty. Um, plastics wouldn't at face value fall uh, within that um, particular frame. And the focus of the request ultimately it seems to me relates to matters relating to the control of pollution and protection of the marine environment arising from climate change. So the, the connection of pollution, climate change, greenhouse gas emissions are all fairly clear in terms of the way in which the, the question uh, has been uh, posed. Now I've got some other things to say but those are just some sort of general uh, initial responses to the actual questions themselves uh, that have been posed. Now. Um, Consistent with, with the points that I raised previously, we need to go and ask, well, okay, what, what is the um, legal basis upon which uh, the Commission of Small Island States had to be able to uh, submit this question uh, to the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea? So um, the relevant article of the um, agreement, the 2021 agreement, um, is Article 2.2. Uh, which I've extracted, extracted here, um, and the wording is very clear that the Commission shall be authorised to request advisory opinions from ITLOS on any legal question within the scope of the Convention consistent with Article 21 of the ITLOS Statute and Article 138 of the ITLOS Rules. So um, it would seem that, that when the Convention was drafted um, that there was a, a clear understanding of the importance of having very clear words in the, um, the agreement to unambiguously make clear to the tribunal and to the um, international community that this commission did have this capacity uh, to make uh, this request consistent with the uh, procedures uh, that we've, we've spoken about. So what I've tried to do is um, sketch for you a, a general picture in terms of advisory opinions uh, and then secondly advisory opinions as they relate to uh, maritime matters and uh, the law of the sea and uh, now I just want to begin to focus really in on on island questions. So Chagos um, is a really significant advisory opinion by the International Court of Justice. Um, it has significant um, dimensions with respect to issues about decolonisation, uh, self-determination um, and it has ramifications for a number of other non-self-governing territories uh, which have yet to attain uh, independent status uh, and uh, much of that context of course sits within the, the general framework of human rights but um, much of it is in my view very particular to the ongoing status of a number of island states and territories and I've given you some examples up there at the moment uh, and a number of those states and territories arguably um, are certainly uh, in the midst of processes uh, of self-determination and I suspect that one of those will become a very large independent island um, in the not too distant future. Um, and then, of course, the significance of this um, uh, advisory opinion uh, to ITLOS is, is significant and I'll unpack that in my, in my, final, my final slide. So, um, Nulfer and I had the um, great opportunity in, in, in Seoul a few months ago to actually uh, toss around some issues about what the future of advisory opinions are. And um, I think, I think um, both of us were quite optimistic that that, um, that there's a lot of potential for advisory opinions to be utilised in multiple different ways. Um, uh, I, I had a, uh, a legal officer in the Australian government say to me just before Christmas that they thought that we might be entering an era of advisory opinions. So I thought that was interesting from a, a legal advisor within 
the Australian government who was looking towards the events um, that had occurred throughout uh, December. So um, th there are clearly uh, multiple possible options arising from uh, the advisory opinions um, under, under the mechanisms that we've been talking about. Um, we know of course that to get an ICJ advisory opinion up involves a lot of um, internal uh, UN uh, processes, uh, diplomacy and can be often a long and, and challenging road. Um, but nevertheless, we've, we've seen some interesting ones go forward. Um, but, but what is particularly interesting, of course, in terms of our area of interest in terms of the law of the sea is, is the apparent simplicity, um, not wanting to in any way dismiss the, the diplomatic uh, energy and effort and, and weight that needs to be given to the negotiation of any treaty, but the relative simplicity of the way in which um, an advisory opinion request can be made to ITLOS uh, via the uh, Article 138 mechanisms that we're, we're talking about. So um, the potential impact for these advisory opinions on the law of the sea, especially the Commission on Small Island States one, is, is quite significant. Um, we know that um, the ITLOS itself in um, uh, the Mauritius Maldives uh, case uh, observed that certainly from ITLOS's perspective, they gave a lot of weight, legal weight, to the significance of, of advisory opinions. So in terms of the, the precedential value of an advisory opinion um, for ITLOS moving forward, um, the current judges on the tribunal clearly um, view those processes and those outcomes with some level of, of solemnity. Um, and once again, if, if some of the things that I've been heard said in, in public fora by judges of ITLOS are accurate, um, well then Seabed Disputes Chamber advisory opinions uh, may well be uh, quite common aspects of how the tribunal certainly views um, its working uh, mechanisms and protocols uh, and its workload uh, moving forward once uh, deep sea bed mining uh, commences um, given the, the multiple issues that could possibly arise in terms of the actions of the International uh, Seabed Authority and the Assembly and, and the like. Um, could ICJ advisory opinions be reverted to in the absence of some of these processes here? Quite possibly. Um, and we of course know that there's a, another um, well advanced um, process in terms of looking at an ICJ advisory opinion on some of the matters that I've been uh, talking about in terms of the Law of the Sea Convention. Um, and, and could ITLOS and the ICJ compete for advisory opinions? Quite possibly. Um, a number of scholars have, have said that that could possibly be quite undesirable. Um, so we'll, we'll just need to see how the dynamic uh, plays out. So here's my, my final slide, um, and this is very much um, focusing in on, on the regional uh, implications of this issue to pick up uh, one of the points I was seeking to address here. Um, the outcome of, of, of the Commission on Small Island States Advisory Opinion, um, especially given the way in which it lost views, the significance of these advisory opinions, um, and of course the way in which um, ITLOS could approach the question and answer the question. Um, but its potential can really be very dynamic for this region, um, not only in terms of uh, Southeast Asia, uh, but the Southwest Pacific. So we'll, we'll sort of use the generic term Asia Pacific uh, generally. Um, so a whole range of issues that could be unpacked in terms of sea level rise, the status of baselines, uh, stability of maritime zones. Uh, we know that these are, are major contested issues uh, in the South China Sea, in the Southwest Pacific. Um, and they're also um, really important issues increasingly for archipelagic states. Um, and some of you are aware of some interesting research that's being done on that in terms of um, the possible implications of sea level rise and the loss of archipelagic states of certain features that they rely upon for their archaeologic baselines. There's also the potential, it's perhaps just potential at the moment, that we might see some unpacking or some discussion on issues of land reclamation. 
and artificial islands and the interaction between Article 60 and Article 121. Um, you might argue that those are perhaps a bit marginal to the Commission on Small Island States advisory opinion request, but um, we, we know that those issues of land reclamation and artificial islands were ones that were sort of left hanging by the South China Sea award, so there could possibly be more to come on that. Uh, we know that um, as a result of some of these issues, um, there's, there's concerns being raised by many states within our region about the loss of territoriality um, and uh, issues arising from that. Once again, that goes beyond uh, the scope of the, um, the Commission on Small Island States Advisory Opinion request, but it's one that could possibly trigger um, other uh, questions being put, certainly to the, to the ICJ. Uh, I think I've touched on the significance, my view, about the Shagos advisory opinion uh, and then the way in which we're starting to see uh, a coalition of these issues in terms of climate change, state responsibility and LOSC environmental obligations, especially given that the, uh, the Small Island States advisory opinion request focuses on, uh, on, on part 12 of the convention, it is really an interesting uh, emerging dynamic. So colleagues, I'll leave that there with those uh, preliminary remarks, pass over to Nolifer and um, look forward to the opportunity to discuss some of these questions in due course. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, uh, for the fascinating presentation. And now I would like to introduce a moderator and discussant, uh, Dr. Nilofer Ora. Uh, Dr. Nilofer Ora is a director. Okay. <laughs> Uh, for ex okay, Ooh, yikes. for accepting our invitation uh, to speak today, and many thanks to all of you actually for joining us. Uh, we're really delighted to have you, uh, and it is wonderful not to be uh, uh, looking at a video screen, and um, and not to put you on the spot, but we're especially delighted to have Tommy Ko, uh, third president or. Uh, uh, well, president of the third <laughs> uh, conference for the law of the sea. So I'd like to get your insights on this as well. Um, and also we have a special guest uh, visiting CIL, my dear friend, uh, Professor Jerry Talati, um, who is also a member of the ILC uh, as well. What's this? So I haven't prepared comments and I will just make some brief comments but I, because I think we really should have a discussion. But I first have to uh, just thank you for giving a very clear outline, uh, both the general aspects of advisory opinions, starting with, of course, a little bit of the history. And the reality is that the courts, starting from the Permanent Court of International Justice, like to give advisory opinions. Uh, there are uh, one, I think, the, the permanent court and one ICJ in total of many, many advisory opinions. Um, and now we see, of course, it law. So I think the likelihood is that they will give. So the question I ask is a little bit also, um, there seems to be when advisory opinions are raised, and including at the, we, I had the great pleasure of being on the same panel with you in Seoul, and speaking to colleagues, and boy, articles written, there is some skepticism about advisory opinions. Um, I think uh, scholars in particular are more likely to find fault with it than support it. Um, and my question at some point is why? Um, do we see an advisory opinion that has actually had a negative consequence? Because ultimately, advisory opinions um, are to clarify the law. And, and we can talk about maybe in our discussion with COSIS, uh, which I have to tell you, I'm a member of the Legal Expert Committee. I'm not representing a state, though, but just a member of the, the Legal Expert Committee. And, and as wonderful a convention as the Law of the Sea Convention is, it was a pre-climate change convention. So there are many questions, legitimate questions, um, uh, on that. So I guess one issue is why is there this uh, focus on the negative aspects, possibly, of advisory opinions? 
Uh, and do we have evidence that there has been negative aspects? And I think Chagos is a fascinating case um, because I think it has really moved forward a very delicate, very politically sensitive issue. But I know now they're actually UK and Mauritius are negotiating. Um, and one issue is fascinating is how it lost in the Maldives Mauritius case for maritime delimitation um, addressed it. Um, and so one other question I would have, we might discuss, what does it mean for not OK, advisory opinions are not legally binding, but they have legal authority. And that was underlined very much um, in the uh, Maldives Mauritius uh, delimitation case uh, by Itlas. Very interesting case. Um, so these are just some questions that I wanted to pose. Um, and it does seem, though, there's a great deal of enthusiasm for advisory opinions. In addition to the Vanuatu, Vanuatu uh, request that's undergoing for ICJ. Um, the ITLAS request, we also know, of course, the uh, Palestinian um, request that's come up for the ICJ. But we also have the Inter-American Court Latin America, uh, also for human rights and climate change. So I guess another question is, what does this reflect? Is this something we should be welcoming? Is this a sign of trust in international law? Is it a sign of confidence? Um, and why are we not seeing, um, for example, in some of these, why are we not seeing uh, uh, cases uh, more on uh, what you call conf conflict-based cases? Now, I, suddenly I can't think of the right word. <laughs> Contentious, yes. Um, so uh, these are just some questions I have, uh, genuinely, um, because I tend to be on the side, and you said as well, we more uh, positive about advisory opinion. So, uh, uh, and I think, and, and I will stop here, the one and only experience I had in international case was representing IUCN at the IUU uh, fisheries case. And IUCN actually is an intergovernmental organization. And once again, IUCN has been invited uh, to participate in the um, recent advisory opinion uh, uh, it lost. And, um, and there, as you mentioned, um, it, it was, the case was about IUU fishing. And we know IUU fishing, illegal, unreported, unregulated fishing, uh, is a concept that emerged after the 1982 Law of the Sea Convention was adopted and, and ratified. Um, so to me, it's an example of a case where it actually did bring clarification um, to flag state responsibilities. It was extended, the, the tribunal extended it beyond what seemed just very uh, administrative responsibilities under Article 92 to include fisheries. So again, should we be looking more at the glass being Half full or half empty? And I'll just stop there because I think we have lots of discussion, but these are just some of the comments and questions I have. And I thank you again for an excellent presentation. Well, um, thank you, uh, Nulfa, for, for those um, observations. Are we concerned about advisory opinions? And we, I use that term in the context of the international legal community, which includes obviously practitioners, diplomats, government officials, scholars. Uh, are we concerned because it opens the door for judicial activism in ways that we are not necessarily familiar with in uh, contentious cases before uh, international courts and tribunals. Um, and is there some nervousness about it because in addition to opening that door, are we in an era where lawfare is being utilised in many different settings. And there are multiple, multiple interests out there uh, 
who are now actively looking at utilising international law in ways that the principal players in the international legal system states never really anticipated. So certainly from the perspective of state legal advisers in foreign ministries, I can well understand why there would be a high level of nervousness about whether or not we are entering an era of advisory opinions. Um, the, the other question I guess that, um, or the other response I've got is that we've seen some examples of some advisory opinion requests that as we know have raised exceptionally sensitive international issues of, of great delicacy for certain uh, states, major players in our international legal system. And Chagos is clearly an example of that. The Palestinian war case is clearly an example of that. Uh, in which, if, if you read the, the submissions made before the ICJ, um, one of the principal challenges to the court in, in suggesting that the court should not exercise its jurisdiction, should decline to exercise jurisdiction, and that's not consistent with the judicial function, is that the questions that were being posed were political questions as opposed to legal questions. Or that, or that in the case of Chagos, uh, a question that was being posed to try to resolve a dispute uh, uh, between states uh, rather than to actually elevate the the legal questions. Now, I should make it very clear that I don't believe that um, that, that is the dynamic that exists in the, the current advisory opinion request before it lost, but I think it, it does give some indicator as to, as to why um, states in particular, I think, may, may be nervous about um, whether or not we are entering this era of advisory opinions. Thank you.